started, I just kind of want to give a, uh, just an idea that is completely unrelated to anything that we are about to talk today. Yesterday was one year since my father's passed away. Yesterday was one year. And I got to thinking because yesterday at the, the concert, he sang a lot of songs about heaven. And I, was, and I was thinking about heaven, and then I got to thinking, heaven's not it. Heaven's not the, the they tripped. Lamar used to say heaven's the final goal. Heaven's not the final goal. And I was thinking about first century Judaism, and those people didn't even have an assurance of heaven. They had an assurance of something greater, which was a resurrection. So you see Christians in the New Testament that, yeah, Paul gets excited for heaven, to be absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord, but they get really excited over a resurrection. And that's a big deal because, because in, in other, uh, other religions of the day, when you died, your body, that, that was it. That your body's gone forever and you spend eternity separated from your body as some sort of disembodied spirit. Christianity is the only one that's different from that in that we actually get our bodies back. So, so God created us as a body, soul, and spirit together, a, a trinity, if you will, and... Ultimately, at the resurrection, we get to unite all of those things back again. And we get to dwell with them in bodies that we're familiar with. We don't have to be disembodied spirits. I thought that was cool. I'm looking forward to the new Jerusalem. Honestly, I wouldn't mind traveling and go see the old Jerusalem. I hear it's pretty neat. It uh, is. Yeah, and I mean, compare and contrast the new versus the old. But if I don't ever get to see it, see old Jerusalem, that's okay. I'll get to see the new one. And it's, it's going to be plenty big enough Amen. for all of us. So anyway, we're going to talk about angels. That was, that was free. That's just something I wanted to put out there that, yes, I, I am excited for heaven. I am excited to get to see uh, mom and dad again. But at the same time, I'm more excited to see them in bodily form at the resurrection than I am to see whatever their spirits look like. Maybe their spirits look better. I don't know, but we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully my spirit looks better than what my body does. But today we're going to talk about angels. We're going to talk about angels. Uh, ultimately, Christians are pretty confused on the topic of angels. Uh, even in one of the songs that was sung last night, a uh, beautiful old hymn, How Beautiful Heaven Must Be, great one. Literally, the third verse talks about angels strumming their golden harps. Where does that come from? I'm texting JB, uh, and I'm like, JB, are they doing it like with their snake arms? What, with their fiery snake arms under their wings with eyes all over them? Like, like whoa. An angel's scary. We'll get to that later. But the thing is, is where in the world does it talk about angels playing harps? David played harps. But we don't ever see an angel coming down and strumming Metallica on a harp. Like We don't ever see that in the Bible. So my thing is that what exactly do we picture when we think of angels? And if you just ask around, hey, what does an angel look like? You'll typically get one of three answers according to where you are in the world. You'll get a curly-haired baby in a cloud diaper floating around shooting arrows. That, that's... Google the word cherub and you get a whole page of little babies with, for some reason, they all have curly hair and they're all shooting arrows and they're all chubby. Apparently, that's our favorite type of babies, curly, chubby babies. Or you'll get, uh, if you go more classical high church, you'll get a sepia-toned Italian man in robes with wings. That is to say, he's going to have a very thin face, he's going to be very gaunt, and he's going to have nice big wings. Or, you're going to get a beautiful blonde-haired woman, or man that looks very womanly, with white robes and white wings and a halo. That's what you see. 
and they'll have harps or they'll have trumpets. Think of every Christmas tree topper you've ever seen. Big white robes and some sort of stringed or brass instrument. You never see an angel with a tuba. <laughs> Trombone. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've looked for an angel playing a piano. Can't find it. Can't even find them doing God's instrument, the organ. You, you just can't find it. <laughs> but angels in the Bible are a little bit different from an Italian-looking man in a white robe. They're a little bit different from a baby. A baby has never had to walk up to you, put his hand out, and say, Be not afraid. I don't know if you met some of my grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> some of them, it's after you get to know them, you're, you're, you're intimidated. But angels in the Bible are a little different. Their appearance is a little bit more terrifying. Uh, their demeanor, the way they act, is honestly a little bit more otherworldly. We, we tend to humanize everything. We, have, we even have a term for it. We call it personification. That is to say, when you're reading a book and it talks about non-human things in human terms, the tree danced in the breeze. A tree can't do the polka. The tree's just shaking. But we, we put it in terms that we understand as humans because guess what? We're humans. That's the only way that we understand the world. God puts himself a lot in human language in this book. Sometimes he doesn't, and it's otherworldly and it's confusing because we're not otherworldly. We're mortal. We're human. We only understand human terms, so God speaks about himself in human terms. But angels, their demeanor is a little unworld, otherworldly. The way that we would describe it, the word we would use is weird. Weird. Not human. And honestly, their purpose is very defined. Angels have a singular task that they will be appointed to do, and then they go and do that task single-mindedly. So one thing that we have to remember when we think of angels, like I said, they are not humans. When you die, I don't even know where this, I can't find where this idea originated which means it must have originated somewhere in the Americas in the last hundred years. The idea is when you die, you become an angel. That's false. That's absolutely false. Or, well, they're angels now in heaven. They're messengers in heaven. What? What are you talking about? That makes no sense whatsoever. We are a separate class from the angels. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus, whenever he was made human, became a little lower than the angels. So we could even say we're low class compared to the angels. Uh, unlike Terry, who is high class. He is a high class oh, man. Yeah. And then you got me, no class. So what we have is that angels are a creation like us, but they're different. Than us. They're a different creation. And, and if we have trouble understanding that, dogs are a creation, but they're a different creation than us. Cats are very much different than us. Squirrels, maybe they have a fallen nature <laughs> like we do. Demons. <laughs> but what we have is that angels are spiritual beings. Whereas we are triune beings. We are beings of a trinity. So, so you may say, whoa, that almost sounds sacrilegious. We know God is a trinity. Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Man's a trinity. Body, soul, and spirit. It's almost as if we're made in the image and likeness of God. Well, angels aren't. They only have one of those. They're only spiritual beings. Invisible. Angels, what I found interesting, they were not a confusing topic to ancient men. And by ancient men, I mean take your Bible, open it up halfway on the left side. Those are the ones I'm going to call ancient men. Every culture in the ancient world was concerned with the spiritual. All of them were. 
Anytime you look at an ancient culture, and I'm even going to say a culture up until what we call the age of rationalism, which was around the, the 17, 16, 17 hundreds, whenever a great, I believe he was German man, may have been French, said, God is dead. Nietzsche, uh, yeah, that's German, said, God is dead. And the age of rationalization is now upon us. And now we don't need the spiritual anymore because we have technology and great things. Before this time, men were very, very concerned with the spiritual. Every culture had gods. Every culture had spirits that affected the world around them. And really the oldest evidence of this is the religion of animism. Animism. So animism is this belief that every individual thing in the world has its own spirit or its own soul, its own other world, excuse me, other worldliness about it. So for example, the trees have spirits. Before you cut a tree, you need to make sure that its spirit is okay with it. The, the fire has the fire spirit. So whenever your hut burns down, it's because the spirit in the fire was angry. Everything has a spirit in it. We still use terms like that today. The spirit of the age. This is something that's crazy. Animism actually predates Judaism. We tend to think that, that the Jewish religion is the oldest religion in the world. It's not. Animism actually predates Judaism. And you may say, but Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve weren't Jews. You, you have to remember, Judaism doesn't actually really start until Moses, till the law. So, so you have the whole book of Genesis that's a history. Sure, we have Abraham, but Judaism doesn't start with Abraham. It really starts, and the nation themselves start as an actual covenant nation people with Moses. So animism, when, when Abraham was a pagan before God called him to start, he was an animist. He worshiped the moon. Uh, scholars say that Abraham probably was an idol maker. And the Bible honestly never says that his dad quit. So Abraham may have been the only believer in his whole family. We don't know. But ancient men, they were concerned with the spiritual. And what's crazy is that it hasn't really gone away. When Europeans arrived into the Americas, so we've got... 1492, that's when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, Terry. The, then what happened is they get over here, they meet the Aztecs, they meet the Cherokees, they meet the Iroquois, the Sioux. They meet all these Native Americans in the America, and guess what their chief religion was? Animism. Animism. And honestly, it's even been carried over into modern times, which we see with kind of an idea of the, uh, the ecological movements of we have to respect nature, and we do, and, but we don't respect nature to the point of over human lives. We, we take care of what God's given us, but we always have to go in with the mindset of humanity is the priority. Uh, what's crazy is that you can still see animism 100% active and in work today, and that would be in the country of Japan. With uh, Japan, they have kind of this mixed uh, religion of Buddhism and what they call Shintoism, and they revere spirits to this day. It is nothing rare to see a Japanese businessman on his way to work stop by a shrine to the spirit of the woods and give them a quick bow before he goes to work. It is completely and still alive to this day. Animism is, I guess, Satan's first real uh, rodeo, and he's still riding that bull today. So the fact is, is that every religion has these active spirits. Every one of them. So does Judaism. 
So does Christianity. We have active spirits in our religion as well, and angels are those active spirits. But the difference for us is that we know that our spirits, they actually also predate Judaism. When you think of, of something and you think, how could somebody have come up with this? How could somebody have come up with something like animism, thinking that everything has its own spirit, everything has uh, a spirit that is either happy or sad or mad or fills the whole range of emotions? How would they come up with that? Because people knew the spiritual. People knew that there were spiritual forces. There were spiritual beings. And so it predates formal Judaism. So first, I want to talk about just a history of angels, and then we'll get into what they are and what their roles are if we have time. So the history of angels, let's start at the beginning. God creates everything, Genesis 1, in six days, he rests on the seventh. So angels are either created during this time or God's created them in the past and they've dwelled with them up to this event. I tend to lead into the former that God probably creates them sometime during the rest of creation, but I wasn't there, so I can't tell you. It's not written down where exactly he made the angels, but we know that God's a creator God, so God must have created angels at some point in time. Uh, if angels existed just as long as he did, that means they're equally as powerful as he is and equally potent, which we know that is not the case because angels will not and do not accept any kind of worship. So after that, in Ezekiel, in uh, the Gospels, Jesus talks about it. And when you look at the midpoint of the book of Revelation, which is kind of the break of Revelation where it tells a little bit of history, it speaks of this war in the heavens in which the adversary leads a third of the angels, the, the dragon swoops a third of the stars, uh, and they fall to earth. So in rebellion against God. So Satan, he decides, nah, I can do better than this, as is detailed in Ezekiel. He manages to get a third of the angels on his side, and then Jesus says, Satan was like a falling star. I watched him fall from heaven. So when Satan fell, the earth was formed. There was an earth at this point. Because a star can't fall to earth if there's no earth. So the, the point where Satan fell and rebelled was creation had happened. So it's assumed that his allies fell as well. That, that when Satan was cast from heaven, that his allies, his army that he had created was cast from heaven as well. I don't know if that looked like a meteor shower. I don't know if God teleported them. I don't know what he did, but now you have demons on earth as well. So some of those fallen angels, we call fallen angels demons, roam the earth, while others, as it says in Jude and Peter, are chained in the lowest hell, Tartarus, remember that from our hell talk, awaiting judgment. And we'll talk more about demons uh, probably next week. We're not going to get to it this week, which is good because I didn't write anything down because I knew we weren't going to get to it this week. So this event happens somewhere between creation and the fall of Adam. So somewhere between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 3, there's a war in heaven. Satan decides, which I think is the foolish thing ever. Who wants to go to war with God except for, you know, all of humanity? Because the Bible says we are at war with him until he is the one that breaks our will and puts us down to make us friends of God instead of enemies. But Satan decides, hey, let's go to war against the greatest force in the universe. He obviously loses, still can't accept the loss, and won't accept the loss until his final punishment in Revelation. But it happened somewhere before the fall of Adam. Now, we don't know how long Adam and Eve lived in paradise before sin happened. We don't know. People talk about trying to date the age of the earth. You've got your old worlders and you've got your young earth creationists. I, I 
I tend to fall somewhere in the middle of that. I don't feel like scientific dating is as accurate as what they say, considering the fact that things, dates keep changing. And I don't feel like saying the earth is only like 6,000 years old. Well, maybe it's, I mean, it could potentially be older than that. One thing that, that we don't take into consideration though is how long we're Adam and Eve on the earth before this, this happened. I mean, wars take a long time. Perhaps that war in heaven lasted a little while. We don't know. But what we do know is that Adam lived, the Bible says, for 930 years. But my question is, is this measured from his creation? Or, because you have to think, at the point of his creation, Adam is immortal. It is immortal. Time may exist, but not really. Because nothing dies. And if nothing dies, there's no need for time. If nothing wears out, there's no need for time. If, if nothing breaks, there's no need for time. Nothing has to be replaced because everything's perfect. So my question is, is Adam's birth measured from when God breathes into him? Or is his years measured from the time when the death penalty is announced upon him? I tend to lean onto the later because time is irrelevant when you're immortal. But once God says, you're going to die, that's when you start counting, well, how long is it going to be until I die? So if that's the case, if that is the case, then we have an undisclosed period of time where Adam and Eve are in this garden. Could have been a millennia. Could have been 30 minutes. We don't know. But we have a period of time that we can't account for where mankind is in paradise. Which, honestly, brings relief to me. Because whenever we are resurrected and in the new Jerusalem, in the new paradise, we have an undetermined infinite amount of time to be in that place where time doesn't matter anymore. Watch manufacturers are going to hate the new heaven and new earth. So after this, God creates war in heaven. The first that, that we see angels kind of flex a little bit of their power is in Genesis 3. Because remember, angels can do things that we can't do. And that's in Genesis 3, where Satan decides of all things to take the form of a serpent, a snake. Now, at this point in time, snakes apparently had appendages. Uh, honestly, I'm terrified of snakes. I am morbidly afraid of snake. And if I was to see a snake bounce up and start running at me with some running legs... <laughs> I'm going straight to heaven because I'm dying of fright right there. Especially because snakes are mean and if they had arms, they would totally have a knife. They would be running at you with a knife. So we see that he takes the form of this serpent. And, and we'll talk about it too whenever we speak of the seraphim and what they look like. The word literally means like a fiery serpent. And Imagine like a dragon. So, so we think of this little snake coiled around a tree talking to him. When I think of Satan talking to Adam and Eve, I'm thinking like a giant stinking dinosaur. Like, like I'm talking smog is coming out there and smog. I mean, because think about it. I mean, you don't typically listen to things that are smaller than you. A tiny little snake comes up with his little nub arms and his nub legs, and he's like, eat the you're going to be like, no, nah, I mean, I don't really respect you. But then whenever you have a stinking T-Rex coming at you, you're like, eat the fruit, man. Like, okay, bro, all right, I'll eat the fruit. I'll eat it. And the fact is, is that we see that serpent again in Revelation where he's finally cast into the lake of fire. And I like the word that the King James uses to describe him. They call him a dragon. A dragon, because I think that that's pretty metal, and that's pretty cool that Satan's got the form of a dragon. So when he's in the garden with Adam and Eve, I don't imagine this little sissy snake. I'm imagining this giant creature 
that little intimidating because we also know Satan is full of himself. So Satan, who at this point in history has fallen, he's been cast from heaven, he has hit the earth like a meteor, and Satan has fallen into sin. He tempts Eve and he deceives the human race to fall into sin. That's why he has names in the Bible like the adversary, the, the deceiver. Satan's not a proper name, it's a title. My favorite is Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies. That is just disgusting. I love it. But not only that, God curses snakes to lose their appendages, and now they have to slither on the ground and eat dirt. So honestly, there is no wonder that snakes are such angry animals because they are cursed animals. So Satan, not only does he ruin lives of a third of the angels, not only does Satan ruin lives for mankind, Satan ruins lives for snakes. I wonder if whenever God cursed them to that, I wonder if snakes were bigger and more dragon-like and he shrunk them down. I don't know. That would have been a blessing. Can you imagine like a giant dragon-sized snake? I don't want to live in that world. Mm -hmm. So, Genesis 3, 24. That is where angels first appear in the Bible by name, by, by books that we have here. And that's where God sends a cherubim with a flaming sword to prevent mankind from entering Eden ever again. Now, whenever you're looking at that in Genesis 3, 24, not only is this a literal historic event, but my goodness, God waxes really poetic right here. And I love it whenever God, I like poetry. I, I do. I'm, I'm kind of a jerk, but I'm also a little bit of a romantic at heart. Way, way down, way down deep in there. Hidden under all the, the jerky stuff. But in this, God waxes poetic. Because he puts this angel in front of the Garden of Eden and says, you will never be in paradise while you live. Men will never enter true paradise, what we were created for, until the new Jerusalem, and we could call that a new Eden. So, so we have that, that we're closed off from the old Eden. We're closed off from paradise. But God in his mercy says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create you new bodies, redeemed bodies, <clears throat> that when you're resurrected, will be prepared for the new paradise. I like that. Paradise lost, paradise found. Those are books. So what's interesting is at this point in history. So Moses is writing these books and he's writing down what has happened from the beginning of the world until the time that he lives in that day. Moses does not bother the stinker to explain what a cherubim looks like. And yet at the same time, cherubim are crafted and overlaid in gold to flank the mercy seat on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. So that goes to show me that the Jewish people during the time of Moses at this point in history, when you said cherubim, they knew what a cherubim was, they knew what it looked like, and they knew what its purpose was. Oh, a cherubim, that's that thing that guarded the... Uh, the, the uh, Garden of Eden. Oh, a cherubim. That's, that, that's the things that are sitting, worshiping around God's throne. And God says, when you craft my representation of my throne on earth, the mercy seat, I want my cherubim flanking my throne as it is in heaven. So how in the world would it be that those Jewish people knew what a cherub looked like without being told, well, I imagine the descendants of Adam and then later the descendants of Noah 
probably spoke about what their parents saw in the Garden of Eden. Or even in Adam's case, he lived so many years, he may have told his great, 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 great grandkids the firsthand story of what happened. We know that, that an oral tradition is not the best way to pass down information, but an oral tradition is pretty good when you get it from a firsthand source. We call that a witness. Well, Adam lived long enough to witness his story to a lot of people. Then in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, that's when it starts to get interesting and starts honestly getting weird. Sons of God in chapter 2, or verse number 2, sorry, typically refers to angels when it's used in the Pentateuch. That's the first five books of your Bible. Anytime that, that it talks about sons of God, it's usually referring to messengers and messengers of angel. That means in Genesis 6, that would mean that angels are taking on human form and mating with human women. The, the sons of God found that the son or that the daughters of men were, were very becoming. And then they create this race of things called Nephilim, which they call mighty heroes and men. The term that we would use there would be demigods, if you wanted to use a mythological term, like Hercules, demigod. Well, ultimately. This is an absolute abomination. This happening here in Genesis 6 is not how God designs it to work. He does not design the spiritual beings to mingle with the fleshly mortal beings. So now we say, well, who in the world are the sons of God? Well, theoretically, most likely, these are the demons that have already been cast down to earth with Satan and his rebellion, and they are seeking to corrupt God's creation directly. Chan and then I'm going to take that a step further. Chances are these sons of God that begin to mate with the daughters of men and create abominations, the mighty heroes of renown, chances are it's those demons that are the ones that are chained in Tartarus, the lowest hell, in reserve in shadow for the everlasting judgment. You say, why, why would you say that? And I would say, because I believe that God made examples of them to prevent this from happening again. Because you don't see this happening again after the flood. You don't see angels taking on mortal wives and, and well, it doesn't even say that it takes on... There, but, but you don't see angels having babies with mortal women and creating these these demigods, if you will, these Nephilim, why would that be? Well, I think God made an example of them. Remember Jesus' encounter with Legion. Please don't send us to the pit. Why would the demons be afraid of hell if some aren't already there and they know the punishment that awaits? Well, God tolerated their evil up to a point. But then, whenever they went too far, he destroys some of them, causing the other demons to kind of rethink how far we'll go. And I think that this event must have been a wake-up call for angels because throughout the rest of the Bible, you only see two types of angels, and that's obedient angels that serve God and fulfill his purpose, and then you see disobedient angels, but, but the way in which they disobey, they, they seek to corrupt humanity, but they only do it in a sly, more behind-the-scenes kind of manner. The farthest that you see a demon go is full possession of a human being. You don't ever see them mate with humans again. And I, my theory is that the demons were subdued out of fear. That some of them went too far. God chained them up in shadows in the lowest pits of hell. And the other demons said, okay, don't do that anymore. Like the, like the kid on the playground that's picking on somebody, the bully that's picking on a kid and then the bully gets his nose flattened and the kids say, ooh, we ain't gonna mess with that kid. That's what the, the demons do here. Whoa, we ain't gonna mess with that guy. We found something that pushes his buttons. He'll put up with possession 
he won't with copulation. So then for the rest of the Bible, and I will end here, I think it's about time, is you get to see angels doing really cool stuff for, for, the, for the rest of it. You get to see them fighting battles for Israel. They deliver messages to humans. Uh, some angels, if, if they weren't God themselves, they eat a meal with Abraham. I put that on there because I think that eating is cool. Uh, then you have this cool character called the Angel of the Lord. He's most likely a pre-incarnate Jesus. We're not even going to get into that. That's a whole series of lessons by itself. They announce the birth of human Jesus. Angels get to be in visions and dreams, which is cool. That means spiritual beings can, can influence dreams. So if we ever sleep in heaven, I just want y'all to know I'm going to haunt y'all's dreams so bad if, if we have the power to do that. Uh, Sometimes they take human form and interact with Christians. The Bible says you can entertain angels unaware. Uh, they lead John through the book of Revelation. And then ultimately, the last we see of angels in the Bible is that you get to see angels ride back with the armies of heaven in Revelation at the Battle of Armageddon. I've talked about that. The divisions of Jesus' returning army. Not only are the saints coming with him, but angels are going to be coming too. I don't know if it's just warrior angels. I don't know if it's all of them. I don't know. Maybe they're going to fight with harps. But you have angelic history, and it predates human history. This is the coolest thing ever. Angelic history predates human history, but now it's tied to the mortals in which angels interact. So their history may have started before us, but their end, I say end, we don't really end, but, but their ultimate ending in the Battle of Armageddon is tied with us. So angels, we get to fight alongside angels, which next week when we talk about their appearance, I'm hoping I'm in a unit of humans because these are terrifying. So uh, what we'll do is that that was... Just kind of a history uh, of angels uh, from the beginning to the end. And then next week we'll talk about what they look like and maybe we can talk about their purposes and maybe we'll get to talk about fallen angels too. Maybe. Let's pray and then we'll go worship. Lord God, I want to come to you and I want to say that I love you. Lord, I thank you for letting us know about the spiritual side of life. Father, that, that even though we live in this age of rationalism where all that we're concerned with is the body, something within us knows, and Lord, I guarantee it's our spirit, knows that we are spiritual beings, that, that we do have spiritual ties, Lord, and that there's something that ties us to the divine. It was your very breath that awoke us from just being dirt. Lord, I pray that you would continue to educate us, continue to let us be spiritual, continue to meet with us. Lord, you're a spirit. So if we worship you, we have to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, don't let our rationality destroy our spirituality. God, let us worship you in spirit and in truth. And you are the truth. I love you. And I thank you for being who you are. And I thank you. That when we're so unwise, you said we could just ask and you would give us wisdom. I praise you in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.